When it comes to batteries, we have Duracell and we have Energizer. In the US, those are the only two even worth mentioning. What, were you gonna say Rayovac? Because that's just part of Energizer. It's all part of these two, which means they're in direct competition with each other and have been for a long time. So I'd like to look at how this happened and how they've competed with each other over the years. Duracell was started in 1916 by a man named P.R. Mallory. He initially named it after himself with the intention of manufacturing tungsten wire light bulb filaments. In the early 1920s, he was contacted by an inventor named Samuel Rubin who was looking to buy some of that filament wire. I imagine that initial meeting must have gone really well because soon after, the two of them started working together. In the early 1940s, they came up with the first ever mercury cell battery, which in many ways was superior to the existing carbon zinc battery. It was more durable and more compact, making it valuable during World War II. They spent some time making batteries for the war effort, and then afterwards switched to making them for the everyday consumers. The economy was good, everyone was buying these new fancy electrical gadgets and in need of some batteries to power them. They took advantage of the growing demand and batteries were becoming a larger and larger part of their business. I should point out that for everything I've been talking about, up until 1964, the name Duracell didn't even exist. All of these batteries were sold under the brand PR Mallory and that was the year they introduced the Duracell brand. In the early 1970s, they introduced that copper Upper top look and in doing so I'd say they developed into the brand that we recognize today. Soon after they developed this identity is when everything started to change. I'm about to speed through a lot of changes here. It gets a little crazy so I'll do my best to keep it all clear and easy to follow. Here we go. In 1975, after 59 years with his company, P.R. Mallory died. Then in 1978, the company, which was still named after him, was bought by Dart Industries for the price of $215 million. As soon as they bought it, they started giving the Duracell brand more focus than it had ever received before. They got rid of just about every other section of the P.F. Mallory business, keeping only Duracell and going so far as to make that the new name of the company. In 1980, Duracell's new owners merged with Kraft, and then six years later split apart, but Kraft was able to hold on to Duracell. Two years after that, in 1988, an investment firm called Kohlberg Kravis Roberts bought Duracell from Kraft in a massive $1.9 billion leveraged buyout. <laughs> One year later, in 1989, they put it up on the stock market when they sold about a third of it to the public. They introduced this new battery tester, which from personal experience, I can tell you can really cause some damage to your finger. They had this ridiculous marketing budget to get the word out there, plus the demand for batteries in general just kept growing. As a result, the value of the company just kept increasing. In 1996, Gillette felt it was worth it to buy the company for over seven billion dollars. That's three and a half times the price that was paid for it just eight years earlier. Then, in 2005, Procter & Gamble acquired all of Gillette, which included Duracell, for the price of 57 billion dollars. Oh, holy cow, that's not even the end of it. In 2014, Procter & Gamble announced that they would be spinning off Duracell into their own company. But then, weeks later, it was announced that they would instead be sold to Warren Buffett's company, Berkshire Hathaway. Now, the details of this one get a little tricky. Berkshire Hathaway was actually the biggest shareholder of Gillette back in 2005 when they were sold to Procter & Gamble. So now, in 2014, Berkshire Hathaway bought Duracell specifically from the portfolio using $4.7 billion worth of Procter & Gamble stock, effectively giving them back ownership of their own company in exchange for the Duracell brand. All right, that's where they are today. Looking at Energizer, actually, this company was called Union Carbide for most of their existence, and they go back even further, if you can believe that. These roots go back to the late 1800s, but we can say that they were formed through the combination of a few different companies in the early 1900s. Instead of going through over 100 years of corporate history this time, let me just point out some of the major highlights, most of which are inventions. Of the two companies, I would say this one has been more innovative over the years. In 1896, they're credited with inventing 
inventing the first ever dry cell battery intended for consumers, which was a big deal. That essentially marked the start of this battery industry that we've been talking about this whole time. Two years later, they used that invention to create the first flashlight. They called it the electric hand torch, which I thought was funny, but it was a flashlight. Skipping ahead, all in the 1950s, they introduced the first hearing aid battery, the first 9 volt battery, the first watch battery, and the first alkaline battery. Now, this alkaline battery was also a big deal. From a scientific standpoint, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but here's what I do know. That first dry cell battery in 1896 was essentially a carbon zinc battery, which were the standard in batteries for the next 60 plus years. Then in 1959, as I said, Union Carbide sold the first alkaline battery. If there's anyone watching this that could give a more technical comparison between alkaline and carbon zinc batteries, I encourage that. But I can tell you that these alkaline batteries were simply better. If you go to that battery section in the store today, most of what you see there will be alkaline batteries. Well, despite inventing them and being the first to introduce them in 1959, Union Carbide failed to capitalize on them very well. They were selling them under the EverReady brand, but I think they underestimated their demand. The carbon zinc batteries continued to be their main focus up until the 1980s, and they certainly weren't treating the alkaline batteries like they should have. Meanwhile, Duracell was. They were over here making a few of their own improvements, and almost immediately released their version of it with massive advertising. In 1980, Union Carbide finally recognized the importance of these alkaline batteries, so they introduced a separate line of them called Energizer. Their new brand of batteries quickly helped them gain some ground on Duracell in that alkaline market. Some changes over here now. In 1986, Union Carbide sold their battery division to Purina, the pet food company, for $1.4 billion, which I'll point out was comparable to the $1.9 billion sale of Duracell two years later. Then, in the year 2000, Purina spun off the segment into its own company called Energizer, and that's where they are today. I wanted to mention, in 2003, this is funny, they bought Schick, the razor company, from Pfizer for $930 million, which I have to think was a response to Duracell and Gillette coming together, so we had this weird thing where both Duracell and Energizer were teamed up with a razor company. When looking at the figures for these two over the years, they're a little hard to compare because the ownership kept changing and most of the time both brands were part of a larger company that owned other major brands as well. But overall, I think it's very safe to say that these two brands dominate the industry. Looking at some recent market share data from 2016 in the US, Duracell is number one, with a decent lead over Energizer, who is at number two. And we can see that the two of them combine for an impressive two-thirds of the market. But then, consider this. With the exception of private labels, everything else on this list is either Duracell or Energizer. Energizer has always been together with EverReady, and now they own Rayovac as of 2019. So, I don't know, I guess you could call Duracell the bigger brand, but the Energizer company combined with all of their other brands are just right there behind them. I'd say that's a fair comparison. Now, I want to spend the rest of this video talking about bunnies, because it turns out these two brands have similarities that you would never expect. First the razor involvement, and now this. Oh, this is funny. I bet most people watching this don't realize that both of these brands use a pink bunny as their core advertising mascot. And I say most of you don't know this because it's split geographically. If you're from North America, I'm sure you know the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going and going and going. But then... <laughs> I just learned about this guy recently, but if you're from anywhere outside of North America, you should be familiar with the Duracell bunny. I know, to all of the Americans watching this, that sounds made up, but it's 100% real, and I'm going to tell you how this happened. The Duracell bunny was actually first. He goes back to 1973. Remember, I said Duracell had a jump start when it came to promoting alkaline batteries. Well, this was one of their attempts to show how their Duracell alkaline batteries were superior to the old carbon ones. Here's how the commercial went. The drumming toy bunny that was using the alkaline Duracell batteries outlasted the rest of the group who were still using the carbon batteries. That was the idea of the commercial, and along with other similar campaigns, it was effective enough to pull them ahead of Energizer as far as alkaline battery sales. So then, 16 years later, in 1989, Duracell wasn't using that campaign anymore. They were sort of drifting away from promoting their use in toys and promoting a bigger variety 
variety of uses, and in doing so, they let their trademark expire, meaning Energizer was legally able to use those drumming bunnies in their commercial. Their concept was admittedly pretty funny. They essentially referenced the other commercials, and the claims that Duracell made about outlasting the competitors. Then, they had this Energizer bunny come in that stood out from all the others with his bigger drum and cool sunglasses. The narrator says Energizer wasn't invited to those playoffs, because nothing outlasts the Energizer. Then the bunny leaves the set because no one can stop him, because he keeps going and going and going. The whole thing was just a clever way to directly make fun of Duracell's commercial. So now, the Energizer bunny was becoming popular, and you could imagine how Duracell might take issue with this. They had some legal battles over the rights to use that pink bunny in their advertising that were finally resolved in 1992. They made a deal that effectively said Energizer can use the bunny in North America, America, and Duracell can use it everywhere else. So if you're from North America, you know the Energizer Bunny, and if you're from anywhere else, you know the Duracell Bunny. But I still don't think that either one is too happy with this arrangement. The arguments have continued on as recently as 2014. That's when Duracell put their bunny on packaging that was sold in the US, and Energizer took issue with it. It's just a weird thing, because both mascots have been so prevalent in their advertising for decades. I fear that they may be sharing this pink bunny mascot forever. Oh my gosh. So, to summarize everything, this has been quite a feud. It's not often that you see two companies this dominant in their industry, to a point where there's not even a third one worth talking about. They have both helped make batteries what they are today by innovating and shaping the industry over the past century. Let me know in the comments, did you know that there were two separate pink bunny mascots? But besides that, what do you think of these two companies? This could be interesting. Is there one that you prefer over the other? I mean, in the end, how much do you really care? They all serve the same purpose, maybe with some minor differences, but they're just batteries. It's hard to make them much different than the competitors, so that's why advertising has been so important. They compete on public perception and brand recognition, so the mascot could be extra important. So are you a Duracell person, an Energizer person, private labels, whatever's cheaper? What are the factors that cause you to choose one brand of batteries over the other? I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.